All right, well, this morning, we're looking at four verses, uh, the, the concluding verses of Romans 13, where Paul is, is going to exhort us, encourage us, admonish us to do what it is he's just been telling us to do, and see, which is, of course, well, we're going to review that, honoring the government and loving our neighbor, and, of course, loving God, which we looked at last week as well, uh, which is all a part of of just being equipped to do his work, of laying aside the deeds of darkness, putting on the armor of light, uh, becoming more like Jesus. So let's read this text, and um, then we'll, we'll dive into it. Okay, so Paul writes in verse 11 of Romans 13 through verse 14. He says, do this, things that he's just mentioned, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Well, again, th th this is instruction for our good. These are things that we, we need to do. We need to take to heart. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Now, remember, Paul has been encouraging us to give everyone their due, to submit to the government because God ordained the government. And to submit to them is to submit to him. That's why we need to <laughs> submit to it. He's also ordained it for our good. And we understand anarchy is not a good thing. But, so there is control. We need to thank the Lord for that. And he's also given government the power to enforce that law. If we don't obey them, then we can expect punishment, the sword. But remember as well, when they do contradict God, we do need to disobey them. And even if the sword falls on us, God will honor us. But because they're ordained by God for our good, we're also to pay taxes because this is how God has um, really ordained that their work be supported. They're governing on our behalf, and so we need to support them. And as that, regarding the government, was an application of the fifth commandment, which is to honor fathers and mothers, really all authority, he went on to tell us of our obligation in the other areas towards our neighbor, towards everyone else, which is to love our neighbor, all of them, as we love ourselves. But in a very specific way, the way that's outlined in the commandments by helping to keep them morally pure, protecting their lives by not injuring them, but also feeding and clothing and sheltering them, and to protect their souls by sharing the gospel with them and praying for them, uh, protecting what belongs to them, not even wanting the things that they have, but also protecting their reputations by not spreading lies about them. So Paul was addressing the, what we call the second tablet or the second table of the Ten Commandments. We really probably shouldn't be referred to in that way, but um, it's the last six. But we also looked at the first four. Paul didn't address those since he was dealing with how we should love our neighbor. But since they were arguably even more important, we went on to look at them last week in the evening and saw that God calls us to put him first in our lives, in our hearts, to love him most of all. He needs to be the very center. We do everything for him and for his glory. We need to worship him as he calls us to worship him in Scripture, uh, you know, not be innovative in our, in our worship especially in our worship services, keep the, the vows that we made to Him, the promises that we've made to one another, um, and keep His Sabbaths holy by resting on this day and by meeting together for worship and by spending the whole day with Him. Now, both Jesus and Paul told us that all of these commandments can be summarized by love, Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as we love ourselves. And remember, Dr. Ferguson would refine the second commandment uh, 
because we really don't know how to love ourselves today, at least in our culture, he would say, love your neighbor as Jesus loved his neighbor, because Jesus is the one who did it the way God wants us to do it. Jesus did all these things perfectly and has not only become for us the only source of righteousness by which we might be justified by trusting in him, but an example of how we are to do these things, an example of how we are to live for God's glory. Paul now goes on to encourage the Roman believers to pursue these things because of the time. Time was running out, and so they needed to press into this work, and that's really what we need to do, okay? and that's what Paul is exhorting us to do through the Holy Spirit this morning in our text. Now, let's try to understand what Paul's talking about here, and it may, it may not be entirely clear, and I can't say that I understand it necessarily, but I have a good, I think, idea of what he means. First of all, he says a time, there was a time that was drawing near. He says they should do these things knowing the time, that it's already the hour to awaken from sleep, for salvation is nearer than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. So Paul's giving to us all these temporal references, all these time references. What is, what's he talking about? Well, it's hard to be dogmatic here because these references can really be taken in, you know, a number of different ways. Now, on first glance, he could be referring to the second coming when the night of this sinful world will finally come to an end and the light of the new creation will dawn when our bodies will be fully redeemed as our souls already will have been by the time Jesus returns. I can say that because I'm post mill. And at that time, we'll be filled with lights and joy and, and glory, okay? When full and final salvation has come, you know, some commentators believe this is what Paul had in mind. He was speaking about the salvation that is near is the second coming. But we do need to understand that salvation can refer to, you know, in Scripture, it refers to several different things. It can refer to past, the past salvation or, or salvation from our past sins and guilts. You know, for trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that nothing that we have done in the past will ever be brought up against us. And that's wonderful news, isn't it? We are fully, finally freed from guilt. Salvation is also a present thing. God is saving us from the sins we continue to commit. You know, we, we don't want to commit those sins, but we often do. I guess you might say there's a sense in which we want to do them, otherwise we wouldn't do them. But the new nature tells us or gives us the inclination not to do it. But the Lord is continuing to save us from our sins as well as our other enemies. He's giving us the power to put our sins to death. He lifts us up when we fall into sin. And he preserves us from the evil ones. So there's a past and a present uh, sense of salvation, but there's also that future sense. The day when he will fully deliver us from our enemies, all of our enemies, particularly sin. Either when he takes us out of this world at our death, or when he catches us up at the second coming. Now the question we're asking is, is the salvation he's referring to, the day that was near for them, is that the second coming? Is that what Paul's referring to here? You know, there, there are those who look at all these near references in Scripture and, and believe they're referring to the second coming. Well, if, if that is the case, there is a problem with that. Because if that's what he meant, if Paul believed that Christ's coming was near, in his day, Paul was wrong. Because it's been almost 2,000 years since Paul wrote this. And Christ still has not come. And I think Paul was also well aware of the fact that the gospel still had a long ways to go. There were a lot of people who needed to hear it that the Old Testament scriptures did say that one day the people of every nation, every tribe, every language group would worship the Lord. And that had not taken place yet. So that likely is not what Paul meant unless, you know, as I was talking with Dick... Um, I think it was um, on Friday, uh, unless the apostles, like the, the prophets, didn't fully understand their prophecies, 
you know, and didn't know the time frames. Knew Christ was coming, but didn't know the time frames. But still, I think that that's not what he's referring to. Well, secondly, he could be referring to that which most of these, if not all of these, well, certainly all the near references of Christ's coming in the New Testament are referring to is his coming in judgment in 70 AD. Now, when that took place, the darkness of the Old Testament types and shadows and ceremonies and promises would be fully removed when the temple would be destroyed, when its service would finally come to an end. And the light of the glory of Christ's gospel would shine all the brighter. Okay, days passing, night has come. Now that's possible because when Paul wrote Romans, that, that event was only 13 to 15 years away. So that was near. Still, though, I think what he's most likely referring to is the brevity of life. As James reminds us in James 4.14, that we are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. That we must soon leave this darkness, which is the world, and enter into heaven where, the, where God's glory fully breaks on us. Okay, that's light. So when Paul says salvation is nearer to us than we first believed, I think what he's saying is we're, we're, you know, we're coming toward the end of our lives. They're, they're brief. And soon we're going to leave this world, which is why we need to get busy now. By the way, that's the same message we saw, wasn't it? As we looked at time, as Jesus you know, was admonishing his disciples that we need to work while it is day because night is coming when no one can work. And even though Paul is using these images to apply to different things, Jesus there meant the day of your life is coming to an end and night is when you're dead and you can no longer work in this world. Here Jesus is saying that the night of being in this world is almost over and the day is about to break on us. That's going to come very soon and we need to get busy. But let's, let's just set that aside for a moment and recognize regardless of what specifically he has in mind here. The point is clear. Time is short, and so we need to get busy and be about our master's work. So first of all, he says we need to wake up, awaken from sleep. And he doesn't mean literal sleep. You know, they weren't, it um, wasn't that the Romans were given too much sleep, although some of them might have been. Nor does he talk about conversion, because sometimes sleep can refer to conversion, because he is addressing a a group of people that were Christians. You know, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 14, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Okay? Now, he's not saying you need to be converted, although undoubtedly there were some there in Rome that did. And obviously, he's not referring to physical resurrection, because sometimes sleep can refer to that. When believers die in Christ, they don't actually die. The Bible refers to them as sleeping, okay? They sleep in their graves until the resurrection. Remember what Jesus said about Lazarus after he died? Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and even the disciples didn't understand that. Oh, Lord, that's great. If he's sleeping, then he's going to get better. And then Jesus said, he's dead, okay? But this is for God's glory because he knew he was going to go raise him, okay? But... Christians are said to sleep and not be dead because they're not dead. They're only sleeping, and their bodies are going to wake up again. And I say that just, again, as an encouragement to us over those that, that have fallen asleep in Christ, that they are only sleeping. But what is Paul addressing here? He's not talking about any of those things, but he's talking about the kind of sleep that a Christian can fall into, and that is spiritual lethargy, weakness, that comes on us because we live in a world that is so contrary to the Lord and His ways that, that tends to draw our attention away from Him. One that prizes pleasure, okay? Pleasure for us, pleasure for self at the cost even of other people. These things, living in a world like this, can, can make us spiritually dull, can make us indifferent to the things of the Lord. And so Paul here issues a wake-up call. And by the way, we need the same call to stir ourselves up again to the absolute importance of the eternal, invisible things of God. Now, 
Paul issues the command, <clears throat> and we might ask the question, just exactly how do you do this? How do you wake up? Well, we wake up or are awakened in exactly the way Paul is trying to wake up the Romans right here, by encouraging them, by exhorting them, by admonishing them to wake up and take these things more seriously. Now, how do we get that? Well, we can only get it the way we're getting it this morning. We have to open up the Bible, okay? We need to read it. We need to listen to the exhortations. We need to take them to heart because our Lord is, is speaking of things here and showing us things here that we cannot see with our physical eyes. We can't see the invisible battle that's going on for our, uh, for our souls right now, our warfare against the forces of darkness that are actually causing us to fall into this lull or this slumber that we are in. We can't see, except through the eyes of faith, as we read the Scripture, the things that are ahead of us. The final judgment, the destination of all mankind, either into heaven or hell. God's love and mercy in, in saving us and his desire that we reach out to others with the gospel out of that love because of the love he has shown us so that they might escape the lake of fire and enter into heaven forever. You see, we need to get into the word. We need to read these things with faith. We need to believe them. And then we need to hang on to them, hold on to them, meditate on them, keep our minds focused on these things. You know, Paul talks about in Philippians, whatever things are good and, and lovely and pure, those are the things we ought to be thinking about. And those things will keep us awake. Now, we also need to get together with others who take these things seriously, as we do on the Lord's Day, in our midweek studies, and even outside the church. I mean, just getting together for fellowship, getting together for prayer. So we need to wake up. But then waking up, Paul says there's something else we need to do. Perhaps the activity will help us, you know, not fall asleep again. We need to act. He says in verse 12, lay aside the deeds of darkness. Well, that's a broad term, but that means putting aside sin. You know, all of those things that have to do with the flesh. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us that there's really two things that we need to set aside. And the second one is not really addressed by that phrase. See, first, what Paul here calls the deeds of darkness, the author to the Hebrews calls the sin that so easily entangles us. Those things that are contrary to God's law, those things, and since that law is the law of love, that means those things that are hateful towards God and toward our neighbor. Okay, we need to put those things off. They entangle us. They keep us from running the race. But the author to the Hebrews has a second category, the things that weigh us down. It's like, you know, going out to run the race. You know, it's one thing to, to rope your, your feet, uh, to tie your legs together so you can't run. That's sin. But this is more like trying to run the race with a heavy jacket on or heavy clothing. You're not going to be as fast, you know, if, if these things are weighing you down. Well, those are the things that are not necessarily sinful, but that we can love so much that they distract us and they slow us down. And we know what those things are. They can divert us. And if we devote too much time to them, if we love them too much, they, we will devote too much time and attention to them and we'll lose sight of what it is we need to be focused on. See, we have to do both if we are to run the race that is set before us. So lay aside the deeds of darkness and the things that, that aren't necessarily sinful, that we love too much, but we also need to put on the armor of light. Now, what Paul is talking about here, putting off the deeds of darkness, putting on the armor of light, I think he's going to repeat in the last two verses when he says, lay these things aside, put these things off, and then put on Christ. But he could also re be referring to the armor that he mentions in Ephesians 6. So what we're going to do is we're going to lay the armor aside for right now. Look at that tonight and finish with these last two verses where I believe he's repeating and emphasizing what he has just said. So in verses 13 and 14, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. 
Now, I think Paul here is probably pointing to the most common areas of struggle, temptation in his day. And as we read the list, we say things haven't changed very much, have they? They're pretty much still the same. So first of all, the breaking of the seventh commandment, carousing, you know, partying, that leads to sexual promiscuity, sensuality. You know, sensuality means just, you know, stimulating the senses. And we know, you know, primarily what he has in mind here, but it can be other things. Even the adrenaline rush, that's still a, you know, living according to sensuality. We like the experience, and so we go for the experience. But I think primarily he's talking about the seventh commandment. But he also includes drunkenness in here, which is interesting. And I think it's because that makes these other things worse, doesn't it? Because alcohol, as we know, has the ability to sort of deaden, um, desensitize the conscience and make us disregard the consequences of our actions. Okay? Before I was a Christian, I didn't have much experience with it, but I did have enough to know that when you're under the influence, you just don't care about what you do. So that's something we need to be careful about because if we disregard the consequences of our actions, we will do things that God doesn't want us to do. We won't care. And that's the reason why God condemns it. We're to be filled with the Spirit, okay? And under His gracious control, under His, the influence of love, that would make us, you know, take what God says seriously and not under the influence of wine, which would make us disregard it. Now, the second thing he points out is the violation of the sixth and perhaps the tenth commandments, strife and jealousy. We also need to set those aside, and they don't they really need explanation. He says, set these things aside and behave properly as in the day. Paul here is referring to the fact that when people sin, when people commit crimes, they usually don't do it in broad daylight in front of everyone, although things are getting kind of you know, worse, and maybe we're seeing more of that. But most often it takes place at night, okay, where people can't see it. The people who are doing it can't be seen. You know, most people, not everyone, but most people would never do these things in broad daylight with others watching them. Now, this, this is one of the aspects of God's common grace, and we need to be thankful for it, that people are embarrassed by their, you know, their activities, their sinful things, so much so they wouldn't do it if there's people watching. That's one of the ways that God restrains sin in our society because we're so concerned about what other people think of us. You know, it even helps us, doesn't it? When we're around other believers, it's easier to say the right thing and do the right thing, but it's harder when you're by yourself and those restraints are not there. Well, this is one of those restraints. And as I've said, those barriers are breaking down more and more so that things that people once were ashamed to do in broad daylight, now they're having parades to, to glorify that kind of immorality. So that's simply to say, with things breaking down like this, uh, we need to pray. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray that the church would do what we are called to do here so that God may accomplish His work and spread His kingdom. So instead of, you know, uh, doing the deeds of darkness, things that are done in the dark, we are to live as those who are in the light, who are seen not just by the people around us, but let's not forget, even when we're by ourselves, even when we're alone, we're not entirely alone, are we? God can see us, okay? We are in the light of His scrutiny at all times. Edwards used to remind his congregation of God's all-seeing eye, that God sees and He knows whatever we do, even in secret, even in private, whether good or bad. And uh, one way of putting it is this, that we are, we are as clearly seen by Him as if we climbed up to heaven and did that action right before His throne. That's how present God is. So that's why Paul says when he looks at you, what you want Him to see is His Son. That's what you want Him to see. That's what I want Him to see me do. Here's what His Son would do and why He concludes in this way. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And so as we read God's Word, as we see what Jesus 
is like, Paul wants us to focus on those qualities, on those characteristics, the things we read about in Colossians 3, okay? His gracious heart towards others, his purity of mind, his singleness of purpose only to do the will of his Father, his many acts of love and mercy, and we need to work hard at incorporating these things into our lives. As we see Jesus, we need to clothe ourselves with him. You know, we need to be clothed with Christ in two different senses, right? We need to be clothed with his righteousness, which we receive by faith. But we also need to be clothed with his character. And that only comes through the hard work of putting our sins to death and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why he also says, as we are examining our lives in the light of Scripture, and we see those things that are unlike Jesus, what we call the old man, okay, such as the things Paul just told us to avoid in our passage, we are to work hard at putting those things to death, not allowing any room in our lives, making no provision, okay, no room for sin. Now, John Owen gives us just this helpful, you know, instruction um, uh, that I think will help us. I, I really think that uh, this is something we have to do. Otherwise, we're not going to make any progress. He said, when you're trying to put your sins to death, when you're trying to put off sin, he says, you can't just go after particular sins, okay? He says, we need to focus on the root of the tree, the tree of sin, of corruption, from which the different fruits, which are the different ways that this sin expresses itself in our lives, we need to kill the roots so we can kill all the fruits. Because if we just try to knock the fruits off, then the root will still be alive and it can still produce more sin. So what he's saying is it's not enough to try and subdue particular sins. We need to work to kill the sin that is in our hearts. Go after the root. You have to fight against sin in general and not just particular sins. I, I think that that's, that's quite wise. So this is how we grow in Christ's likeness. This is how we will glorify God. This is what it means to live well so that one day we will be able to die well. So may the Lord help us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for our flesh with regard to its lusts and all that that means. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to um, help us take this to heart, hold on to it, apply it. Um, and as we ex um, examine our lives in light of this, let's also ask him to prepare us to come to the table, having confessed all of our sins and renewing our commitment to him that we might eat and drink to our building up in Christ and receive the blessing of His grace by His Spirit.